Now I'm going to deal with uh, a series of uh, coronal sections of the thorax. Um, here you can see the thoracic cavity, and uh, this is the abdominal cavity. The thoraco-abdominal diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. The thoraco-abdominal diaphragm has a right dome, a central tendon, and a left dome of the diaphragm. The right dome of the diaphragm is a little bit higher than the left dome of the diaphragm because of the presence of the bulk of the liver beneath the right dome of the diaphragm. On the left side, there is the stomach and also parts of the spleen, as you can see here. These abdominal viscera, including the liver, the stomach, and the spleen, they are, although they are located in the abdominal cavity, but they are enclosed by the ribs, by the lower ribs, as you can see here. And that's why fracture of the lower ribs might injure the upper abdominal viscera. On the right side, it will be the injury of the liver. On the left side, the fracture of the lower ribs might injure the spleen because the spleen is related to ribs 9 to 11. In the thoracic cavity, in the midline, you can see the heart. This is the section passing through the heart and the great vessels as well. And on both sides are the lungs. This is the right lung, and you can see that the right lung has an upper lobe, middle lobe, and a lower lobe. There are two fissures, the horizontal fissure and the oblique fissure. The horizontal fissure separates the upper lobe from the middle lobe, and the oblique fissure separates the lower lobe from the middle lobe of the lung, of the right lung. On the left side, there is only one fissure, and that is the oblique fissure, separating the upper lobe from the lower lobe of the left lung. In the section of the heart, you can see that on the left side here, this is the left ventricle, and here is the interventricular septum. I want you to notice the thickness of the wall of the left ventricle. It is very thick. And the apex of the heart here is formed by the left ventricle. On the right side is the right ventricle. Note that the thickness of the right ventricle is much less than that of the left ventricle. Also forming the right border of the heart is the right atrium. Note that the right atrium is very thin in its wall and most of the right atrium is smooth. Opening into the right atrium here is the superior vena cava. This is the right atrioventricular orifice between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And you can see one of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. And note the cordy tendony here that attached to the cusp from one side and from the other side they are attached to papillary muscles. Papillary muscles are better shown here on the left side. Two papillary muscles in the left ventricle. This is the region of the outflow tract of the left ventricle, and it leads into the aorta. This is the outflow of the right ventricle leading into the pulmonary trunk. The heart is covered by the pericardium. This is the fibrous pericardium, and on its inner side is the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. The visceral pericardium is applied to the heart itself and forms part of the wall of the heart. We call it the epicardium. Note that the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium, not only encloses the heart, but also encloses the roots of the great vessels here, extends up into the roots of the great vessels. Inferiorly, the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium, is fused to the central tendon of the diaphragm and cannot be separated from it. Note here that the section passes through the sternoclavicular joint. This is the medial end of the clavicle, and it is covered by hyaline cartilage. The sternoclavicular joint is a synovial joint, and it's characterized by the presence of an intraarticular disc. So this is the intraarticular disc, fibrocartilaginous intraarticular disc of the sternoclavicular joint. This whitish structure here 
is the costal cartilage of the first rib. The first rib is located just beneath the clavicle. In between the ribs, you can see the intercostal muscles. And attached to the outer aspect of the ribs, this muscle is the serratus anterior muscle, which is attached to the upper eight ribs. The lung is covered by pleura. This is the visceral pleura. The parietal pleura is applied to the thoracic wall, the inside of the thoracic wall. You can see here that there is a recess of pleura, which is called the costo-diaphragmatic recess of the pleura, which is located between the ribs. That's why it is costo and the diaphragm. That's why it is diaphragmatic. So this is the costo-diaphragmatic recess of the pleura. It is where parietal pleura is applied to parietal pleura. There is no lung here unless in during deep inspiration. There is also another recess here on the left side, another costo-diaphragmatic recess. Normally, the apex of the lung extends into the base of the neck. But here, it is not very well shown because of the shrinkage that takes place during the plastination. This is the second section of the series of the coronal sections. Again, you can see the liver, the stomach here, part of the spleen on the left side. This is the diaphragm, the left dome of the diaphragm and the right dome of the diaphragm. This is the region of the central tendon of the diaphragm. And you can see that the central tendon of the diaphragm and this section is pierced by the inferior vena cava. This is the opening of the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava, which is located in the abdomen, it grooves the liver, tenalizes the liver, and appears from the upper surface of the liver, immediately passes through the central tendon of the diaphragm, and opens into the right atrium. So this is the region of the right atrium. In this section, most of the heart has been removed, which is located anteriorly. You will remember that we have seen in the last section, we have seen the right atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. The left atrium was not seen in the preceding section. But in this section, the left atrium is located here, because the left atrium is in fact located behind the heart. So this is the left atrium here which is located behind the heart, it is located at a, a, a higher level than the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. It does not reach the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. You can see that most of the inside of the left atrium is smooth, and the left atrium receives the pulmonary veins. These are the openings of the pulmonary veins. Only small parts of the left ventricle is shown here. The pulmonary trunk has already bifurcated, you can see here, this is the left pulmonary artery, and this is the right pulmonary artery. If we go up in the superior mediastinum, you will notice the trachea, which is characterized by the, these incomplete rings of hyaline cartilage, and this is the site of the bifurcation of the trachea, which is located at the level of the lower border of the fourth thoracic vertebra. It is the level of the sternal angle where the trachea bifurcates into a right main bronchus and a left main bronchus. Here, you can see an opening on the left side and another opening here on the right side. These are sections of arches, vascular arches. The right side, the vascular arch is formed by the arch of the azygous vein, where it enters or empties into the superior vena cava and it passes over the hilum of the lung. This is the region of the hilum of the lung. The root of the lung passes into the hilum of the lung, and the arch here is arching above the root of the lung. This is the arch of the azygous vein. On the left side, the arch of the aorta is shown here, which arches over the root of the left lung. You can see that the arch of the aorta is located to the left side of the trachea, and it may push the trachea from one side. Although a trachea is a midline structure, 
behind the trachea is the muscular tube, which is the esophagus. This is the esophagus. And you can see again that the aorta is related to the esophagus. And the arch of the aorta, in fact, sometimes causes a normal narrowing of the esophagus where it is crossed by the arch of the aorta. The left main bronchus, as it crosses the esophagus, also causes a normal narrowing of the esophagus. In the hilum of the lung, you may notice these black structures. These are lymph nodes, the hilar lymph nodes, the bronchopulmonary lymph nodes. And they become black because of the content of carbon particles that have been ingested by the macrophages. Again, in the left lung, you notice that there is a single fissure, that is the oblique fissure, separating the upper lobe from the lower lobe. In the right lung, there are two fissures, the horizontal fissure and the oblique fissure. And these separate the upper lobe, middle lobe, and lower lobe of the right lung. This is a more posterior section Again, you can notice in the abdominal cavity, the liver on the right side, and the right dome of the diaphragm here. This is the left dome of the diaphragm, the fundus of the stomach, and the spleen. All are related to lower ribs. In the thoracic cavity, um, you can see that the section passes through the vertebral column, the thoracic part of the vertebral column. Notice the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae and the cartilages here in between them, these are the intervertebral discs, secondary cartilaginous joints. On either side are the lungs. You can see here that the, this is the left lung with the oblique fissure, and this is the right lung showing the oblique fissure. There's no more trace of the horizontal fissure. I want you to notice the level of the oblique fissure. The level of the oblique fissure as we are going back and back is getting higher and higher which indicates that the fissure is not horizontal. It is oblique. That's why it appears at different levels in different sections. So the level of the oblique fissure was a little bit lower in the previous section and will be a little bit higher in the next section, which is a more posterior section. Here, on the left side of the vertebral bodies, traces of the descending thoracic aorta can be seen. And from this descending aorta, you can see the openings here are of the posterior intercostal arteries. So these are posterior intercostal arteries. You can see their openings here on the right side as well. Both the posterior, the right and left posterior intercostal arteries are branches of the descending thoracic aorta. And as you can see that the descending thoracic aorta is not a midline structure, it is a little bit to the left, related to the left side of the um, vertebral bodies of the middle of the, of the series. And in fact, it sometimes causes flattening of the bodies of these vertebrae. This is the most posterior and the last of our sections. Again, you can see the parts of the abdominal viscera, the liver here, right dome of the diaphragm, the spleen here, and the left dome of the diaphragm. The section has passed through the vertebral arch, which is posterior to the body. You can see here the vertebral canal containing the spinal cord is shown here. On either side of the midline, there is the uh, lung, the right lung, and the left lung. Note uh, the oblique fissure now is at a higher level on the right side and so as on the left side because of the obliquity of this fissure. Actually, the obliquity of this fissure will make the upper lobe of the, of the lung more anterior than the lower lobe of the lung. And you can see that clearly in sagittal sections of the lung. The oblique fissure makes the upper lobe not only superior, but also anterior to the lower lobe. The lower lobe is not only inferior, but also posterior to the upper lobe.